Yeah. 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 So you put out. Oh yeah. Oh. Either is. Oh, but they. Can you do it? Yeah. Um. Hmm. I'll start. Yeah. That. Yeah. That would work. Yeah, I appreciate you know what I mean? Do you know how to fix it? So if you like so you might be able to like do that. So if you pull that out in that thing from your pockets. It might work. It's quite it's quite like stiff, isn't it? To try to pork it instead, because yeah, instead like, like yeah. oh no, yeah. Thank you. First of all, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for the lovely introduction, and I'm so glad to be back in Birmingham. I, yeah, I did my undergrad, master's here. I've been on Astro Salt Committee since my first year when I was in Birmingham, so it's really nostalgic to be back. So today I'm going to be talking quite a bit about what I do in my PhD at Warwick and just give you a bit of the background of the physics, eventually explaining why the stars that I work with are unpredictable, shy and mysterious. Along the way, if you have any questions at any point in the talk, please do raise your hand or shout them out. I will be taking questions at the end. And yeah. Before I begin, just a special shout out. This talk is extra special to me because sitting in the audience in the complete back is my mom. <laughs> and yeah, this is the first time she's attending one of my talks in person. So yeah, <laughs> perfect. Let's see which one works. Okay, so. On this slide are some of my favorite things in the universe. And as my abstract stated, I love guinea pigs. I love radio telescopes. I love things that blow up in space, like the supernova that you see that was in the pinwheel galaxy. And I love accretion, which is when you have two stars or two massive bodies in space, and one of them is essentially taking material from the other body, and then you get a whole bunch of amazing physics happening there. The guinea pigs you see, they are the stars of this talk, yeah. <laughs> the one on, so if we look at the top left picture, the one sitting on top of the lovely cottage and not in the lovely carrot cottage is Barry. And the one inside the cottage, like a normal guinea pig, is Paul. And if you're wondering if they're named after the Chuckle Brothers, yes, they are. <laughs> so, yeah, they helped me, or no, they didn't help me make this talk. No, they were, yeah. Keep your wires away from guinea pigs if you have guinea pig size, because they will nibble on your charger. <laughs> Perfect. So here's the outline for what I'm going to be talking about today. So the first thing that we're going to cover is how to make a CV. Now I know we're all undergrad students in here. We're not writing a resume. We are going to learn about how cataclysmic variable stars are made, which are I think they're the coolest stars out there. Astrosol committee, you can fight me on this after the lecture. <laughs> the second point is how to make jets with CVs. So no, I'm not going to put a resume on a fighter jet and send it flying around the Earth. We're going to look at how we get radio emissions from cataclysmic variable stars and other accreting systems in outer space and what studying that emission can tell us about the accretion physics underlying that and the structures of these stars. Third, we're going to learn about how to make a supernova. 
You'll see that I've put an asterisk in there because please do that at your own risk. Supernovas are dangerous, so do not mess with them. <laughs> also, we don't know very much about supernovae. Like, for instance, about half the supernovae that we observe with one of the collaborations I'm working with called GoTo, which, by the way, look them up if you haven't. GoTo is very nice. Also, you'll get to make a lot of nice puns. So, yeah, like half the supernovae we detect are type 1a supernovae which are a result of something called thermonuclear runaway, which we will cover later in the talk. We still don't know exactly what causes them, even though we've got like hundreds and thousands of them detected. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to see what CVs, not resumes, what cataclysmic variable stars have to do with supernovae and how they could potentially be a progenitor or how they could lead to a type 1a supernova. Lastly, I'm going to talk about how all of this ties in with my particular PhD project, which, or I should say the first project of my PhD, which is working on these very unique, mysterious stars called AMCVNs. So AMCVNs is a class of stars. They are related to CVs, but not exactly the same. And they're named after the first, set, or the first star system that was discovered. And that star system was called the AMCVM. So astronomers are very creative. We just decided any star that's like that or any star system that's like that, we're just gonna call it an AMCVM star. But there, yeah, so there's the two that I'm studying right now for my first PhD project. One of them is the AMCVM, so like the original AMCVM, and another one is called HP Lib. And I'm studying them in the radio spectrum. So in the previous, oopsie, there we go. No. Yeah, so in this image, you can see that I've put a picture of a radio array here. This is a very large array in Central, Amer um, in Central United States. And this, tell us, this is a set of 27 antennae. And I'm studying these two stars systems called AMCVN and HPLib using the very large array or the VLA. And there we go. <laughs> and uh, GoTo is the telescope that I just mentioned which is actually two sets of telescopes. So there's one set of telescopes from GOTO in the Northern Hemisphere and another set of telescopes from GOTO in the Southern Hemisphere, and they hunt for transients. Transients are, does anyone want to guess what transients are in astrophysics? Just shout out answers, it doesn't have to be right. I didn't know what transients were until like halfway through my fourth year. I think you have changes in like brightness, guidance. Precisely. Please don't steal my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, precisely. So Rodri said, transients are anything that change in brightness, and that's what GoTo looks for. So GoTo essentially looks for, it scans the entire sky over a period of like four days, and it detects differences in those images. So if any point has gotten brighter, then that means that, okay, maybe there's a supernova there or some kind of transient. Perfect, so now that we've covered what I'm going to talk about today, let's get into the nitty gritty details. And yeah, there we go. So I am an absolute foodie, which means I try to relate as much of astronomy as I can to food. <laughs> so I thought that I would give you the recipe on how to make a cataclysmic variable star. So the ingredients that you need are a white dwarf star and a low mass main sequence star initially. So these are the first two main things that you need. And if you have a white dwarf star and a low mass main sequence star, in order for them to, be, to form a cataclysmic variable system, they need to be a binary pair. So they need to be orbiting each other, which means that they need to form together. But before we get to how they could form together, let's take a look at how stars evolve. And this diagram that we have here shows that precisely. So there's kind of, if we were to break down how stars evolve, there's two main branches, as we can see in this diagram up there. So our sun is an average size, maybe slightly towards the lower side. Um, it's an average main sequence star, which means that our sun is actually probably not going to blow up in a supernova. And we can follow what the sun does using, as soon as I find my cursor, there we go. <laughs> we can follow what the sun does using this upper panel here, which is, first we have a gas cloud. So that's the protoplanetary cloud that the sun would have formed from. 
a main sequence star forms, which is where the sun is at right now. And as it evolves, it will turn into a red giant. Now, I don't see any children in the audience, so I feel very comfortable saying this. There, it's very likely that the sun will expand past the Earth's orbit, which, <laughs> which means that the Earth could potentially get engulfed by the sun by the time it's in this red giant stage. And, <laughs> and when it gets to this red giant stage, essentially it's just popping up, expanding its radius, and it's going to get to a stage where it's not going to be able to retain all of its material, and it will start shedding its layers. Kind of like, I guess, reptiles shed their skin, I guess. But in a very beautiful way, in a very stellar way. And when that happens, we will be left with a planetary nebula. And the reason we call this a planetary nebula is because early astronomers thought that the white dwarf, so the star, the remnant of the star which is left in the middle, kind of looked like a planet. But really, it's not a planet. It's a star. It's a white dwarf star. And eventually, it will turn. It will become a black dwarf when it's when it approaches the end of that cycle. Now let's take a look and move on to the second branch, which is what happens when it's a more massive star. So this branch is pretty much just there because if I did not include this branch, then a lot of my colleagues at Warwick will be very mad at me because they like studying black holes and neutron stars, and I don't. So <laughs> that's the other thing that could happen. You could get a red supergiant if it's a more massive star than the sun, and those could end as type 2 supernovae. And you know, remember, I don't, I, I don't care about type 2 supernovae. I like type 1a supernovae. <laughs> so yeah, for the sake of completeness, if it's a more massive star, it will go into a red supergiant instead of a red giant. And then it will have a core collapse supernova, meaning that it's yeah, its gravity is going to be more powerful than the degeneracy pressure, which is so the easiest way I can say is a funky quantum mechanics pressure. <laughs> and that, uh, that causes it to contract and then either become a neutron star with the result after a supernova or form a black hole. And nothing escapes from a black hole. <laughs> Perfect. So the key part that we will be dealing with today is this first branch of your... Can you see me moving the cursor, by the way? Okay, perfect. Yeah, it's the first branch, which we want to know how a red giant forms, how we can get a low-mass main sequence star, and how do we get to the white dwarf stage. Perfect, so now we know that how we can get a white dwarf stage, uh, a white dwarf, a white dwarf star, and a low-mass main sequence star. So now we want to know about how they can orbit each other and how we get a binary star forming. Because if we see in this diagram here, we just see a single protoplanetary disk. So how do we get two stars forming from the same planetary protoplanetary disk? Like how do two stars start orbiting each other if it's just one disk? And that's what we're going to learn about. Especially because over 50% of the stars in the universe that we observe, or in the galaxy, they're binaries. So our sun is kind of an outlier in that sense. And more than 70% of massive stars will exchange mass at some point in their lives with another companion. So it's very important for us as astronomers to understand how these binary systems evolve. Let's see. Okay. Perfect. And that brings us to how to make a binary star system. So there's four ways to do this. I do have some favorites. So as a scientist, you can be a bit biased towards which method you prefer over the other if you have enough, I guess, scientific reasoning <laughs> to back that up. So the first method that I found about, found out about what is called the fission method. It's my least favorite method because essentially what it says is that you form a mass, you form a really massive, a really dense young star, but as the star starts collapsing under its own weight or under its own mass to be able to you know, form a proper core and develop into this. This used to happen last year. <laughs> it's the heater. <laughs> it'll, it'll stop a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as this star keeps collapsing under its own mass to form a star, the differences in the pressure across this way mean that it's not able to sustain itself to form just one star, so it literally splits. 
And if you're a physics student, you might have come across the word fission before. So fission is when an atom splits into two because it's unstable. That's essentially what's happening here. The star, the single star that's forming is unstable, so it splits into two stars, and that's how you could end up with a binary. I, I am yet to do more research on this method, but the other methods are a lot nicer. <laughs> the second method is called the capture method, which, as the name suggests, is let's say you have two stars happily, you know, just buzzing across the Milky Way, and one of the stars runs into this other star's gravitational field, and boom, the bigger star, or the more massive star, captures it, and then they orbit each other, and they stay together till the end of time. I don't think it's a very happy romantic ending, because one of the stars is going to have a violent ending, probably. But <laughs> yeah, that is a very possible, uh, a very viable method of getting binary stars forming. The third method, which is really interesting for exoplanetologists and stellar astronomers, is cloud fragmentation. So as we can see in this diagram here, this diagram will come in for disk fragmentation as well. So in cloud fragmentation, what happens is that we can see that... Where's the cursor? There we go. So here we have a protoplanetary disk, and we have the central star forming in the middle. And this cloud is collapsing pretty much around the central body, which is coalescing. But in the process, while the central star causes the cloud to collapse, the collapsing cloud, because there could be some debris, some massive chunks, like, you know, scattered unevenly throughout this cloud, that will result in this cloud, which initially would have been smooth, it will fragment into several pieces differently throughout different regions of that cloud. And when that happens, if there's a certain region which has a larger density, that might start forming a coalescing structure of its own, and you will get a second star forming in that system. So oftentimes what happens is that the central star that you see, that will be the more massive companion, and this little star will be a less massive companion to the main star. And then we have disk fragmentation, and disk fragmentation works kind of similarly, but instead of having differences in, in the densities of, like, yeah, instead of having, how in cloud, in cloud fragmentation, the collapsing cloud breaks into several pieces during the collapse, in disk fragmentation, this happens before you get this, before you get yeah, before you get the collapse causing the disk to break. So because of just, you know, the disk dynamics could be very unstable at the start, that could result in the disk fragmenting even before the first star or the main star that we see in the middle can get a chance to coalesce all the material around it. And yeah, essentially that's how we could end up with two stars. So that means that we've got two of our ingredients sorted, and we've done our first method. Let's see, or our first step. Let's see what our second stage would be. Oh, actually, before that, let's take a look at this really lovely picture. So this picture that you see right here is a star called, or a star system called R. Sculptoris. And it's from the, um, this image that we see, it's from the ALMA telescopes. And this is a real image of the, pro of the process that I described in the previous slide, so the process of forming a binary star system. The reason why astronomers think that this system has a binary star in addition to the star that we have in the middle is because there is a spiral structure to it, which is something that you would not expect if it was just a single star. And I'm going to trace that out. There we go. So we can see that there's a central star in the middle, but if there was only that star, then we would expect almost perfect concentric circles ra like radiating out from the star as, like, as we go out outwards radially. However, in this system, we don't see just that. We kind of see the spiral structure. Do you see that? Kind of like a Fibonacci sequence? And that suggests that there is something else that's clearing out its own path and accreting a lot of the material in this protoplanetary disk. And I guess if, if we are alive a few million, billion years from now and we look at this exact same star system, we will probably see a second star 
clear, which has cleared out the path and two stars like just orbiting each other. It's pretty cool to see binary stars forming because, I mean, two is better than one. <laughs> Perfect. So now we have got our white dwarf star, we have our low mass main sequence star, and now we're going to take a look at how these evolve and how this will result in the formation of a CV system. And this is the second step, so to produce a common envelope. So at this stage, we have two stars which are orbiting each other, and the two stars could have very different characteristics depending on how much mass they started off with, which means that they will evolve at different rates as a result one of these stars will become, a super, will become a red giant before the other star. And that can lead to the stage that we call a common envelope stage. So what we see in this diagram in the first panel is we have, yeah, is we have a star, the red star, which is the star that is evolving slightly faster, and the whitish star, that is the lower mass main sequence star, it's evolving slightly slower. Now, as the orange or the reddish star evolves further and further, its outer layers swell up, it turns into a red giant star, and in that process, there, it, its outer layers, so the outer layers of the red giant star, they could get very, very close to the center of mass of these two stars orbiting each other. So the center of mass is where the gravitational forces from each of those two stars, they cancel out, and in that process, the second star, so the lower mass main sequence star, can kind of steal this red, this red giant star's atmosphere towards itself. And as the name suggests, they will then share a common envelope. So that is how we end up with this kind of, I guess, peanut shell shaped <laughs> stage where both the stars share a common envelope and they're still orbiting each other, bear that in mind, and the core of the red giant star and the main sequence star, as they're orbiting each other, they keep drawing closer and closer in together. And eventually, because of, because of the fact that they're both in this common envelope, which has material, that's when something very, no, like very much known to us on Earth, kind of like air resistance, but much larger scale. You have the loss of angular momentum in the system, and eventually the two stars will try to get closer and closer together to be able to preserve that as much as possible. So the envelope will eventually get ejected as these two stars will spiral in closer and closer together. And eventually this red giant star will turn into a, yeah, it's gonna turn into a white dwarf. And this is where a lot of interesting physics starts to happen. So here in this image, we can see that the common envelope stage has been passed. So they were in a common envelope and then they, the two stars, so the core of this red giant star has come much closer to the low mass main sequence star and the, yeah, and all of the material that was in this common envelope has mostly been ejected and this is what we call a compact binary star system. A typical compact binary star system will have one white dwarf star, which is literally the white star that we see in this panel here, and a main sequence star or any other star really. But the key condition is that the orbital periods for these two bodies is between 90 minutes to 14 hours, which is very, very, very fast, which is why we call them compact binary star systems. When we have a compact binary star system, if they're close enough to each other, and if the white dwarf star is massive enough, we get something called Roche lobe overflow. Sounds very fancy, but it's one of those things that it's not too difficult to understand as long as you don't get into the math of it. <laughs> That's what my PhD supervisor said. She said I should not learn the math unless I absolutely need to, which kind of works for the simulations and data analysis I need to do. <laughs> But yeah, so let's understand what the Roche lobe overflow um, term actually means technically. So the Roche lobe is this theoretical area that surrounds any given body in space 
where if a material, so in this case, a star, if this, uh, this secondary star, which is at this point, it's a main sequence star, so not the white dwarf star, remember, it's still evolving. As it keeps evolving, if, as the other star did, so as the white dwarf previously did, this, the thing called star in here is going to expand further and further. Its atmosphere will get larger and larger and occupy more and more space around it as it puffs up. And consequently, it's going to fill this region called the Roche lobe, which is kind of a sphere, but it's a sphere that is mainly constrained up until this inner Lagrangian point, which is basically a center of mass of the system. When it fills this region called the Roche lobe, it's at that stage that the white dwarf star, which we learned about how it forms in the previous slide, that white dwarf star, which is more massive, can start accreting material. Accreting is a fancy way of saying it steals the material <laughs> from the star. And, and as a result, depending on the properties of the two stars, you could get something called an accretion disk, which is when the material from this star here, so there we go. So from this giant star, when it's filled its Roche lobe, we can see that as it gets closer to the center of mass, the white dwarf can then start accreting material. And we can pretty much see that this has evolved into a teardrop shape because its atmosphere is leaning a bit more towards the gas, um, towards the white dwarf star. Now in this process, a little bit of the mass is still lost from the system, but most of the mass is, yeah, it's constrained within that binary star system. And this is the stage at which we call this a cataclysmic variable star. So I'm just going to, there we go. So yeah, so now we've got our white dwarf star, we've got a low mass main sequence star. We have seen that they have a common envelope stage, which is when the first star, so the more massive star, has expanded to its red giant stage, and that puffed up atmosphere kind of envelopes both the stars. And then the second star evolves, becomes a giant-ish, and fills its Roche lobe, reaches the center of mass, so the Lagrange one point, and then you start getting accretion, so it starts steal so the white dwarf star then starts stealing material from the donor. So some key terminology that we use in such cases is just the donor and the accretor. So the donor is the star which gives its material and the accretor is the more massive star, so in this case the white dwarf star which steals the material. It doesn't really steal it, I guess. It's the law of the universe, it's gravity. <laughs> but yeah, so that's your CV and that's ready to be served or to be studied. <laughs> and that's, there we go. Where is the mouse keeps disappearing? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so now we're going to understand why CVs are called cataclysmic variable stars. Just shout out things that come to your head when you say, when you hear the word cataclysmic. Big. Big? Very bad. Very bad, yeah. Boom. I love that. Boom is very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> the big bad boom. Pretty much, yeah, that is what happens. And that's why cataclysmic variable stars get their name, the cataclysmic variable stars, because they have lots of big bad booms which <laughs> go around. So, yeah. The first step with uh, cataclysmic variable stars is that uh, we can split them into two classes, which is magnetic and non magnetic cataclysmic variable stars. As astronomers, once again, being as creative as we are, the truth is all stars are magnetic to an extent. The difference between magnetic and non-magnetic CVs is the extent to which the white dwarf or the accretor is magnetic. So if the white dwarf is strongly magnetic, we call that a magnetic CV. If the white dwarf is very weakly magnetic, we call that a non-magnetic CV. So if we have a non-magnetic CV, we get accretion disks. And if it's a non-magnetic CV and we get that accretion disk, we don't get synchrotron emissions. So if we want to get jets, so radio emissions at the poles, 
we need something that's going to, you know, create the radio emission. And for that to happen, we need really strong magnetic fields. So if we have magnetic C CVs, so the, uh, the white dwarf is strongly magnetic, we get synchrotron emission. And just as a quick show of hands, how many of us in the room are doing physics degrees? Okay, does anyone want to shout out what synchrotron emission is? I keep Googling this definition myself and I'm a PhD student, so don't worry if you are not feeling confident, just... <laughs> okay, yeah? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You're on the right track, yes. So synchrotron radiation has to do with electrons and electrons and changing speeds of velocity. So synchrotron radiation is when you have electrons moving at relativistic speeds in a magnetic field, but the magnetic field is perpendicular to the velocity, so the direction of the speed or of the motion of this electron. So when you get synchrotron emission, that can be detected as radio emission here on Earth with super powerful radio telescopes like my favorite BLA. <laughs> and this is some, this, so this model is actually developed from X-ray binaries. I'm not going to go too much into detail about X-ray binaries, but essentially with X-ray binaries, it's a binary system, it's an ultra compact binary system, but instead of having a white dwarf and a red giant star, for instance, X-ray binaries will have a neutron star and a black hole orbiting each other, or a neutron star and a neutron star orbiting each other. And accretion physics is quite similar across all of astronomy. So we're like, if it works for extra binaries, maybe it works for CVs. Who knows? Let's find out. Which is why I have a PhD. So I'm really happy they don't know the answer yet. <laughs> so that's how we get jets. And now let's move on to the big bad booms. <laughs> so with CVs, we have something called dwarf novae. And as the name suggests, dwarf novae are tiny explosions, so maybe tiny bad booms, I guess. <laughs> so to make a dwarf novae, you need a non-magnetic CV. So if you have a non-magnetic CV, that means you're going to have, yeah, that means you're going to have an accretion disk. So if we have an accretion disk, that means that we have this giant star that is that's filled its Roche lobe and a white dwarf star, which is drawing material from this red giant star. And eventually it gets to this point where there's so much material on the white dwarf star that the white dwarf star is like, hey, this is way too much material for me. I don't know what to do with it. It's too much pressure. I'm just going to blow all of this material up in something called, in a process called thermonuclear fusion, which is when you have material that is superheated to the point that the atoms start fusing together simply because the pressures and the temperatures are so high because the accretion disk, it's essentially plasma. And plasma is the hottest state of matter there is. The sun is a ball of plasma. So that's, it's pretty, oh no, oh no. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> Perfect. So that's some, so that's what we call a dwarf novi. When the white dwarf accretor has a, has drawn in so much material from its donor that it builds up near the surface of the white dwarf star, and then you have a little bad boom, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so that is what a dwarf nova is. The reason why my talk is titled Shy, Unpredictable, and Mysterious Stars, the unpredictable part is because of the dwarf novae because we cannot predict when CVs will have a dwarf nova again. And every time that a CV undergoes a process like a dwarf nova, what happens is the brightness of the system increases so much that it actually outshines the surrounding region quite a bit and it can mimic a supernova as well. So a lot of supernova scientists and transient astronomers who work with GoTo, they don't like me because I get very excited when we discover a CV and they go very, they're very upset that I get excited about CV. So they kind of like discard all the CVs and then they're like, who wants the CV? So it's like the bounty in a box of celebrations, really. Yeah. <laughs> and 
Yeah, I don't like Bounty as a chocolate, but I like the Bounty in Astronomy, which is CDs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the now this now the next topic, which is the ingredients for Anova. That's the big bad boom. That is the ultimate big bad boom. <laughs> because if you have pressure so intense because of this, because of this, you know, material accreting onto the white dwarf, it's constantly in a state of explosion. It's constantly in a state of thermonuclear runaway. And that is what we call a nova. So it's basically something which is never calm. The white dwarf star is never calm. It's always an outburst. And that's what we call a nova. Da, da, da. Yay, I found the cursor, guys. <laughs> Perfect. So this brings us to something that astronomers or, I guess, transient physicists or cataclysmic variable astronomers like me like to study. So the image that you see right now, this is something called a light curve. Do we have any exoplanetologists or anyone who's worked with exoplanet data in the room? I see a few hands. So in exo, one, uh, one of the common methods to, to detect exoplanet transits is to study how much light we get from the star. And if that light decreases with the transit method, we know that it's that there's a planet potentially blocking this light from that star. I do the opposite of that. So what I look for is spikes and how much light is emitted from a star. So this light curve that we see on the y-axis, we have the V magnitude, which means it's like the visual brightness, or the visible, the visual magnitude, and the x-axis is the time. So it's showing how the brightness of this system, so the dwarf nova system IP peg, how it changes. And we can see that about every 20 to 30-ish minutes, it goes into outburst which means that this system has a thermonuclear runaway process happening at its surface every 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, it has accreted enough material to go boom, and then it calms down. And these stages in the middle are called the quiescent states, and we can study these brightness fluctuations and figure out, okay, this is a dwarf nova, this is not a nova, and this is a CV. And we can study the rotation periods, and there's so much spectroscopy we could do with that as well. So essentially, this is what the light curve would look like for a dwarf nova-like system. Da, da, da. And that brings me to the next part, which is how to make a supernova, or how to make the most commonly observed supernova, which I mentioned previously, which is the type 1a supernova. So this is a very lovely picture. This I think this supernova actually occurred while I was still doing my master's and my supervisor was just one day late in observing this region or he would have been the discoverer of this supernova. <laughs> he was very upset about it in our weekly meetings when I walked into his office. But this supernova is actually in a galaxy very close to us. So it's located in the pinwheel galaxy and the supernova itself was so bright. So it's basically just a star blowing up. It's actually out, it's outshining the core of the galaxy, and that is supposed to be the brightest region of the galaxy. And from the spectrum of the supernova, they were able to determine the type of supernova, and I think it was a type 1a supernova, and now we can start, um, kind of like go into how to make this different kinds of supernovae. The first model we have is called the Chandra, no, the Chandra, the Chandrasekhar mass model, and that is when you have a carbon-oxygen white dwarf. So what that means is that when the white dwarf, so when a star evolves, it keeps getting fusion of materials like hydrogen and helium until it gets heavier and heavier materials. By the time it's a white dwarf, if the white dwarf has only carbon and oxygen, and it's extremely dense, extremely massive, and if it, if it is accreting at the rate of about 10 to the power of seven solar masses per year, and it reaches 1.38 solar masses eventually, it will probably end up as a type 1a supernova because the thermonuclear fusion at that stage will be ignited near the core because of the intense pressures of the plasma that the star is experiencing. The second model, is for the sub-Chandrasekhar mass model. And you still need to have 
a carbon oxygen white dwarf, but if it's but in this case, the star can be slightly less massive, which is why it needs to accrete at a much higher rate. So in this case, the star will be accreting at a rate of 10 to the power of 8 solar masses per year. And once it has reached a stage where it has a helium layer or outside its surface, so this helium layer needs to be about 0.1 solar masses, that's when you get he the helium detonation. So think hydrogen bomb. Like if you take a matchstick near a hydrogen bomb, don't do that, guys. This is just an example. Like just an example. That's pretty much what happens. But instead of hydrogen, there's helium, and that helium gets ignited, and then boom, you have a supernova because of how compressed the core of this white dwarf star is. And the third model, which is one of the leading models for how you could get type 1a supernovae is when you have two white dwarf stars merging. So in our CV diagram, remember how we had the second star turning into a red giant? When that second star has turned into a white dwarf, you could potentially get the two stars merging, and that is when you get type 1a supernovae again when the carbon oxygen white dwarf so one of the two white dwarfs it detonates so they merge after losing angular momentum and this is a question for the physicists in the audience <laughs> or non-physicists as well but let's give it a go let's see <laughs> physicists versus non-physicists who's going to get this answer <laughs> so if you have two systems orbiting each other with ultra like um, or with really compact orbits, and they're losing angular momentum, how can we detect that angular momentum loss on Earth? <laughs> well, I can see Rodri has a thinking cap on. Oscar's got a thinking cap on. James has given up. <laughs> <laughs> I see a hand in the back. Sorry? That is a method that um, astronomers use quite a lot. So we use Doppler shifts to study how stars orbit and each other, and also to detect exoplanets. But that is not exactly how they lose angular momentum, but that's, that's a very, very good answer. <laughs> I'm going to throw a word out there, and I hope someone picks this up. LIGO. Gravitational waves, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so losing angular momentum can be through gravitational wave radiation so that's literally ripples in space-time because two compact objects are orbiting each other so closely they go absolutely insane with how much energy they want to lose and they're trying to keep themselves as stable as possible that they end up losing a lot of this angular momentum in the form of gravitational waves which is why binary star systems like cbs and i'm going to come to amcvns shortly they are very crucial with understanding how yeah, how gravitational waves can be detected on the Earth. Oh yeah, by the way, yeah, as astronomers, we cannot make up our minds about which of these three models it, it actually is responsible for type 1a supernova. It could be none of them, to be fair, but until we have more observations, and we do kind of need more theoretical astrophysicists to figure that out. I'm an observationalist. I only do math when I absolutely need to. <laughs> Perfect, so what am I doing? Please don't answer this question because I do ask myself this question every morning when I wake up. <laughs> and I am kind of in the middle getting smacked by CVs, transients, and AMCVN stars. That is my PhD. So here, uh, where's the cursor again? Uh, there we go. So CVs, we know how they form and what they do. We know accretion physics now. We also know jet formation in CVs. This image that you see, that is Go to North. So Go to North is in La Palma in Spain, on the Canary Islands at a mountaintop. And there's 16 telescopes in the Northern Hemisphere um, scanning as much of the sky as you possibly can from the Northern Hemisphere, detecting transients through something called difference imaging. So image the spot tonight, image the spot four nights later. Is there any differences? Has any region got brighter? That's how we figure out if there's a supernova or not that we want to study. The group that works on GoTo, me included, does not have anything called a weekend. I once woke up at 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning to 200 Slack messages, because that's where we have the GoTo meeting chat or the GoTo group chat. 
someone thought they had detected a supernova and then people who were awake, so the night owls, not me, were <laughs> trying to figure out what that was. Turns out it was not a supernova, it was Saturn's moon Phoebe, which had come into the field of view of the telescopes and we were about to like release something called an astronaut and just announce to the world, we found a supernova! Nah, it was just a piece of rock. How disappointing. <laughs> And the third thing that you see here is AMCVN stars, my favorite, the reason why I have a PhD. So AMCVN stars are when you have white dwarf, white dwarf orbiting each other with periods between 5 and 65 minutes. And all three of these are very interconnected because in AMCVN stars you can also get accretion when the more massive white dwarf star accretes material from the less massive white dwarf star. And the accretion physics, we can kind of extend the accretion physics of CBs. And eventually, one of the theories, as we saw, was white dwarf star detonation. So when two white dwarf stars merge, you could get a transient, so supernova type 1a, and go to is what detects these transients quite well. So I love AMCVNs, and here's why. First point, they're straight up wacky stars. They're they're wacky, they're super messed up, which is why I love them, because they're not normal. <laughs> And they're ultra-compact white dwarf stars, as I mentioned, and they are ideal candidates to study gravitational wave radiation. So as they orbit each other in this ultra-compact like orbits, they radiate gravitational waves and they lose angular momentum, and they will be very good like checkpoints for the future LISA mission, which is going to detect gravitational waves from outer space. And AMCVNs, they are hydrogen deficient, so stars like uh, hydrogen, these systems are pretty much, they, they've lost all their hydrogen, so it's only helium. It could be a potential type 1a progenitor, and it's sneaky, hence the title of my talk was Shy, Unpredictable, and Mysterious Stars. These AMCVNs are shy and mysterious because out of all the white, the thousands of white dwarf stars and the stars we have found in general, over the last 30 to 40 years, we've only found 70 of these systems, and we, we still don't know what they're doing. <laughs> really glad, because that means I get to do a PhD. <laughs> There's a lot of unanswered questions in physics, by the way, so if anyone wants to do a PhD, please do a PhD. <laughs> and this brings me to my favorite diagram. This is a diagram that I stare at when I'm looking into the void at my desk because I have pinned this diagram above my monitor. And this diagram shows how binary stars form and how we can potentially get AMCVN stars forming. So the first method, so we know how a CV forms as of now. So we know how you get the common envelope phase, roche lobefeld accretion, and then second star becomes a white dwarf as well. When that second star becomes a white dwarf, we can get that AMCVN. Sometimes, so in this case, we can see that you could have two common envelope stages, and then you get the white dwarf, white dwarf here, so that's channel one. You get an AMCVN star where one white dwarf accretes material from the other white dwarf star, and then you could get a supernova 1A. I really hope that's the way because I love AMCVNs. I really hope they lead to supernovae. <laughs> The second channel is when you have just a single common envelope, so when you have a non-degenerate helium core. Talk to me later if you want to know what that means. It's too complex a definition. And then you have a white dwarf star and a helium star, so a star which has absolutely no hydrogen. And that leads to an AMCVN which has a helium star as the donor, and then boom, once again, carbon oxygen white dwarf plus another white dwarf star detonates, you get supernova 1A. And then you have channel 3, which leads to, so if you have a white dwarf star and a main sequence star, now before the main sequence star here can evolve into a white dwarf star, if the white dwarf star accretes enough material on it, you could get a supernova 1a once again. Or it continues on, you get a CV, and then that white dwarf star, and then the main sequence star turns into a, a white dwarf, and then you have an AMCVN, and then you could potentially end up with a 1A again, I hope. <laughs> so, in the beginning, 
I mentioned that I love radio telescopes, and now I'm going to tie in why radio telescopes are important to my work. First of all, Oscar, and I want you to listen to this. As a radio astronomer, if I don't have clear skies, I don't care, because radio waves can penetrate that, so I love clouds. Maybe not, actually, but yeah. <laughs> Oscar, by the way, is an observation astronomer who does a lot of astrophotography, and he does not like the clouds. Yeah. <laughs> You can see incredible amounts of detail with radio, uh, with radio telescopes because essentially what a radio telescope does, as we can see in this diagram here, is you have an array of, this is the BLA, the very large array. So this has 27 telescopes and the longest baseline, so baseline is the distance between any of the two radio telescopes, the longest baseline is about 35 kilometers. And the larger your baseline, the higher your resolution. Each of these telescopes has a dish diameter of about 25 meters. And these are absolutely massive. And with interferometry, what you're essentially doing is you're looking at the same patch of the sky, but you're looking, you can account, yeah, but you're observing them in the radio frequency. And interferometry is when you account for the phase differences, the path length differences, and the waves because of how the telescopes are differently positioned. And you get these really high resolution images as a result of that. You see a lot of things that you'd miss out in all of the other wavelengths. And a lot of the jet accretion is only visible in the radio wavelengths. And that's why we need radio telescopes. And also, who doesn't love a big bat telescope? I mean, longest baseline of 35 kilometers and then and a diameter of 25 meters. And the fact that the VLA has 27 telescopes means that it has 27 choose two, as in 351 baselines. So 351 different like configurations observing the same point in the sky. It's an incredible resolution. So this is the Meerkat array. Meerkat is what I worked on in the master's project, and the Meerkat has 64 antennae. And Meerkat is located in South Africa in the, um, I think it's the Meerkat National Park or the Karoo National Park. And here you can see, so, oh, uh -oh, there we go. So this image here is a picture of the Milky Way in the visible light spectrum. This is the exact same region but in radio. And there's so much more detail that you can see. You can see these filaments extending out. We don't know what causes them. And we wouldn't have known this if we didn't get these high resolution images with Meerkat. <laughs> and the reason why I love radio telescopes looking at AMCVN stars is because AMCVN stars, we have not really had a chance to do a detailed study to find out more about their radio emissions. Like we know that they should emit some radio waves because all stars are magnetic, but the extent to which they would emit these radio waves will give us a lot of key insights into how the accretion physics in AMCVN star systems work. As a result, we can either constrain models for jet emission in such ultra compact binary systems, or we could reject models and say, okay, that clearly does not work because this is nowhere close to what we observed and let's come up with something else. So the VLA over the last, yeah, over I guess a few nights in May and June, it spent quite a bit of time observing these two AMCDN star systems, so the AMCDN and HP Lib. And I now get to analyze that data. And I still don't like, I, yeah, with radio data for a single star, the data set is about 60 gigabytes large. So my baby computer cannot handle it. And as a result, it takes a lot of time to process those images. But fingers crossed, if we get any detection, guys, in a year from now, you will find a paper with hopefully my name and my collaborators' names with detection limits of radio emission in AMCVN stars. Also, if we understand AMCVN stars better, we will potentially get a step closer to figuring out what causes half the supernovae that we observe, like what causes type 1a supernovae. Gosh, I really hope it's because of white dwarf stars merging. <laughs> but I re yeah, as long as it takes us a step closer, even if it, the model is not correct, at least we will have narrowed down potentially what the correct models are. And then we will answer one of the biggest unanswered questions in modern astrophysics. 
The final thing that I want to mention is if you want to take a sneak peek at what radio astronomy is like, and if you want to play around with interferometry, there's something called the Friendly Virtual Radio Interferometer. And if you scan the link, it will take you to the GitHub page and you will get to install a little package and you will, fit, you will get to see what radio images look like, or what radio data looks like when we observe it and how you can reconstruct the actual object creating that radio emission using processing. And yeah, I would say save the URL. Do not try doing this on your phone because the data files are really large. <laughs> but yeah, that brings me to the end of my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So, official, so the title of my PhD is Accretion and Outflows in Extreme Astrophysical Environments. And the first project that I have is to study radio emissions in AMCVN stars. The reason being, we haven't had any dedicated studies for radio emissions in AMCVN stars. So there's two possible outcomes which could happen. We detect AMCVN stars, oh, sorry, we detect radio emission from these stars and boom, I'm going to be over the moon because <laughs> that's, that means that we can like, develop models further about what causes those radio emissions. It could be synchrotron emission, it could be another thing called cyclotron laser emission. It will help us decide which emission method could be the reason why. Or we detect no radio emissions because the radio emissions are so faint. And in that case, we will be able to place a limit saying that, okay, at, um, up until like this frequency, no radio emissions were found. So we have to go to fainter like wavelengths or fainter frequencies to be able to detect it. So either way, it's going to be, it could be a null result, but in science, sometimes even null results are very helpful because that helps you say that, okay, we need to go further on because the physics says that there should be radio emission. It's just a matter of knowing how strong that emission is, which will help us figure out what the physics is. I'll just go back to that slide super quick. There we go. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's two protostars, exactly. So you have one protostar, so the main protostar forming in the middle, and then because of the cloud having different densities and you know disturbances and the smoothness of the cloud, you could get a second kind of like protests are forming and spiraling around this region and as a result you will get something that looks like this in reality. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no problem. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> She's a chemistry professor by the way. I'm so screwed. Tell me. <laughs> Exactly. So it's not going to be like the sun because at this stage, by the time it gets to the white dwarf stage, fusion has occurred to such an extent that all of the hydrogen has fused into helium. 
or most of it, and then most of the helium will have fused into other heavier compounds like silicon and carbon and oxygen and nitrogen as well to an extent. So it is these heavier elements which will like dominate the white dwarf stars. So the white dwarf star will mainly have carbon and oxygen in it. It will have certain amounts of like trace, it could have trace amounts of like iron or magnesium or other heavier elements. But in a lot of cases, especially with white dwarf stars, because white dwarf stars, when they exist, they haven't undergone a supernova. A supernova is where you get iron, magnesium, and all those heavier elements forming. If you detect iron or magnesium or any of these metals in the, like within the white dwarf star spectrum, that is probably because the white dwarf star, before it became a white dwarf star, had planets orbiting it. And then when it became a red giant star or a super giant star, it engulfed these planets and destroyed them. And it's the remnants of those planets which have iron cores and magnesium cores which show up in the spectrum of the white dwarf star. And this is actually what one of my colleagues is studying. It's called white dwarf pollution. And white dwarf pollution is when you have these yeah, when you have planets which disintegrate because of the evolution of the star and then they pollute the spectrum of the white dwarf star. So while the spectrum will mostly have carbon and oxygen because of fusion proceeding to that extent, it could have trace amounts of iron and magnesium, but those will not be because of fusion. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Rotary, right next to you, right next to you. <laughs> Um, how did you how did you find that? Oh I did, yes, I did share that. I was like, did you look me up on ADS? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did share that on Instagram. It was a break, it was a milestone of my PhD. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what I released on TNS, I'll give a little bit of background. So TNS is a server for high energy astrophysicists. TNS stands for transient name server because we're so creative. <laughs> And in TN, like on TNS, what we do is anytime we get spectra for any transients, so it could be supernovae, it could be CVs, it could be these things called F-bots, which stand for fast blue optical transients. No idea what they are. If you ask me, I'm going to be like, I have no idea what they are because even like, yeah, like the, the other PhD students in my department and in my office who are working on F-bots, they are trying to figure out what F-bots are. So sometimes we even upload those onto, these, um, onto TNS. So what I uploaded onto TNS, or I uploaded on behalf of like, the rest of the team as well, was a collection of the different transients that were observed in the previous night of observations. So there's the NTT telescope in, um, in Chile, and it's, I think it's part of the ESO, so the European Southern Observatory, and they have this program called PESTO. <laughs> PESTO got extended, and now we're at ePESTO Plus, extended PESTO Plus, <laughs> and this, uh, this survey essentially does uh, studies like classification and follow-ups of transients. So there was a team which said, okay, these are the transients observed, here's 40 of them, can you try to observe and classify them? So depending on the weather conditions, this telescope gets the spectra, and then the data reduction team wakes up in the morning and then gets the spectra, and then we try to deduce from the spectra, looking at the, the absorption lines and the emission lines, what materials are predominant in it. Depending on what materials we find, we can match that with our database. The database is called, one of the data, the, our favorite database at Warwick is called SNID, which stands for Supernova ID. <laughs> and what we try to match templates from SNID to our, um, to our detected spectra. And with that, we can say, okay, this is very likely to be a type 1a supernova or a type 2 supernova. There's like 50 different classes of supernovae depending on where the emission and absorption lines are. So what you saw on TNS, oh, sorry, on Instagram, <laughs> where I uploaded the link for the TNS uh, astronaut, was that was a report of all the different transients that were observed the previous night. I believe most of them were type 1a supernovae. There were a couple of type 2p supernovae. There was a type 
1AX and there's, there was also type 1A91T and each of those funky names stands for a difference in the spectrum essentially. So that report was just a report of the spectra so there hasn't been any science or any analysis done past that stage but our hope is people will use that spectra for their papers. Yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Perfect. Yes? Ooh, that's a very good question. So it depends on the kind of transient event. If we have like a type 1A supernova, for instance, it will... Is there a marker for the around here? Oh, there's a one on your laptop. Thank you. <laughs> so if we have like a type 1A supernova, for instance, so supernova in general, I'm going to have the brightness. I'm going to say that that is luminosity, and that's L. And this is your time period in days. It could have a rise time typically of a few days, gets to a certain point, and then if it has a very gentle slope, that is gen generally a type 1a supernova, so it will rise up to its peak brightness in say, a few days, and then it takes much longer for its brightness to go back down to normal. So for supernovae, typically you're looking at scales of about two to three weeks, you can see stuff happening within those scales. With nova likes or dwarf novae, the scale will be a little bit different, so it could be over the range of just a few days, or so in some cases, a few hours even. So, yeah, so with transient, uh, okay. <laughs> so with transient physics, uh, or supernova physics, we're looking at scales of two, two to three weeks. With CVs and other accreting systems, we're looking at hours to days. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Yes? I know that um, you, you might put um, astrophysics based on astrophysics and astrophysics based on some time. I know that has a little bit of a problem in the physics, but I'm not sure if you might talk about it. Is there any difference? I can tell you confidently that there will be a difference between the magnetic fields and my deduction would be that the magnetic field of a white dwarf star will be slightly weaker because when it gets to the white dwarf stage, so the way that the sun works for instance, our main sequence star is it has these convective and radiative layers. So you have the convection zone, you have the radiative zone and it's those convection currents and the way the plasma works that generates the magnetic field in a white dwarf star, the layers are very, very different, and you don't, and the layers are not as large. It's got slightly less material, so the magnetic field would consequently be weaker. Further than that, I don't have an answer yet, but yeah, generally white dwarf stars do have weaker magnetic fields than main sequence stars, which is why observing white dwarf stars in the radio spectrum gives us more information on the magnetic fields of the white dwarf stars as well, which is what we're trying to observe with VLA and MIRCAP. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. <gasps> yes. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you have any questions about like PhD applications or life in academia as well, we yeah, you can yeah, ask me as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>